I've said several times the past, oh, year or so that there's no snow in heaven. And I'm going to tell you, God's humbled me. Uh, Every Sunday, it seems, it snows. And the next two weeks, it's supposed to snow on Sunday. So I apologize, God. (laughs) I'm just not going to live in that corner of heaven where it snows. So it's good to have you here. Thanks for getting here. I, I hope it was safe. You didn't slide too much. And we're glad you're here with us to worship God to hear from God. Let's pray as we will begin the service. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> your love for us. <clears throat> and though I don't like it, I, I thank you for snow. It shows us a great example of, of uh, purity. <clears throat> it shows us what we can be uh, if we believe in Christ, if we repent and confess of our sins, that even though we've made ugly decisions in the past, you can wipe those clean. And make us white as snow. Father, we thank you for that. What an awesome privilege that is uh, to be called your sons and your daughters. As we gather together, the family of God, I pray, Father, that you'll be pleased with our worship. I pray you'll speak to us. You'll bless this time with your presence. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, say hi to some folks. Welcome to people around you, okay? We are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, and then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the 
darkness shaking All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name And then my heart came alive Your love is great Shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. What a love we found, death can't hold us down. We shout it out, we're alive, cause you're alive. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. God is awesome. This song is going to be sort of our anthem over the next several weeks. We want to make this declaration together that we believe in our God and His Son and the Holy Spirit. So sing this with us if you believe. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, our Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three. Jesus. 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, I believe in you. Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name. the sun. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again.
grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't stop. Quite a few times over the years, I've been asked, how do you believe in God? Now, sometimes it's asked in a way that's challenging or 
uh, it's, it's kind of getting in my face. Like, how do you believe in God? Like, you're such an idiot if you believe in God. Other times, it's really, it's really curious. How do you believe in God? Like, inquisitive. I, I don't, I, like, I really want to know how to do that. And other times, it's how do you believe in God? And it's more of, of a practical nature. How uh, what does that look like if you believe in God? How, how does it affect you? How, does, how do you know? How, how do you see it in the life of a person? Now, we're talking about the Apostles' Creed. We're talking about what we believe over the next several weeks. And the Apostles' Creed be- begins, I believe in God. So that's the question we're going to answer today. If you're going to say that, then what does that mean? How do you believe in God? Not everybody believes in God. It doesn't take you long to know that. Some don't believe. Now, maybe today we have some here who aren't sure you believe, and you're here to find out. I appreciate you being here for that. If not, we have people, I'm sure, in our lives, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our schools, maybe that don't believe in God I know that because Gallup Polls does a survey every year of people, and one of the questions they ask every year is, do you believe personally in God? Well, they've done that for many years now. In 1994, 96% of the respondents said, I believe in God. By 2013, it was all the way down to 86% responded, yes, I believe in God. Well, by 2016, it had gone back up to 89%, still not the 96% of 1994, but it un- gives us the understanding that, that most people believe intellectually, they believe personally in God, but there's 11% that say no. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't talk about whether they were agnostic or atheist, but that's the reality that we have people around us that are agnostic or atheistic. Agnostic comes from the Greek word gnosis, uh, knowledge, and ah negates whatever comes after, so no knowledge, I'm just not sure. Atheist means not God, no God, and so there are some that identify that way, and, and so in our lives, we probably have people that are agnostic or atheistic. Maybe today that describes us. We're just not sure. The Bible recognizes that as well. The Bible shows us that not everyone either believes with their mind or they may believe, but they choose not to act like it, to live like it. Romans chapter 1 kind of gives us a clear picture of that. It gives us some understanding of that. Romans 1, beginning with verse 18 The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven, Uh, so the judgment of God, the justice of God, is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Uh, From the beginning of time, people have always uh, heard of God, and and they choose either to accept Him or or to reject Him, either to live for Him, godly lives, or godless, Uh, and it's always been a question of pride. From the very Garden of Eden, the first man and woman, it was a question of pride. Do I want to be yielded to God? Do I want to to serve God? Do I want to worship God? Or do I want to do my own thing? Do I want to live my own life? Do I want to to be all that I can be, the master of my own soul? Since what has been made known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, uh, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking, thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were deceived. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. There's a lot there. First, what this says is clearly 
that it should be made known, it should be evident to everyone that there is God, that there is a creator, that there is someone who's far bigger than us. As you look at his creation, it reveals, it shows his eternal nature, it shows his personality, it shows his diversity, it shows that he is all powerful and all wise. And you look around you, it's like that, isn't it? I mean, you look at the diversity of creation all around us, from the different animals to the different environments, from the Arctic to the Sahara, how different the world is, how different his creation is. From the hummingbird to the blue whale, how different his creation is. And then you look at what is said in Scripture to be made in his image, a person. If you've ever seen a baby born, how amazing, how marvelous is it that that baby comes out with all the systems, with the, all the chromosomes most of the time, with all of those parts that when they're made in the way that they were planned to be, they fit together and make a person who grows up with their own personality, their own strengths, their own weaknesses. It only takes missing one thing to show us how amazing it is that most of us have all those working parts. How did that happen? Not by accident. And so what this scripture Paul is making clear is that people, everybody should know. Everybody should be able to see that this didn't happen by accident. So no one has an excuse. We all should know that there's a God by seeing all that has been created. But notice what he said in Romans. He said, these people know, but they choose not to live like they know. They choose to reject that they know. They choose to go their own way, to do their own thing. And maybe that's been you, maybe even today, but maybe in the past you can know that, that you, cho you chose to ignore making God a priority. You chose to, even though you believed in God, you didn't live like that. So what Romans 1 makes clear is, it's one thing to say with your mouth that you know, it's one thing to say intellectually that I believe in God, but the true measure of belief in God is lifestyle. And so he says that God gave over those people who lived in rejection, who lived for themselves away from God. He gave them over. He let them use that free will. He did not force himself upon them like a puppet master, like a robot controller. He did not make them be obedient. He did not make them be godly, and he still doesn't. He's not going to do that. He's not going to make you live a godly life. He's not going to pull your strings. All of us have free will, but Paul makes clear there's a wise way to live and a, a foolish way to live. And he makes clear what that is. So when we say some don't believe, I say there are some who would say I don't believe with my mouth, but uh, there are also those who don't believe in the way they choose to live. For others, the sticking point is not so much God, but it's, it's Jesus, the Son. There's the words of God, the Bible makes clear uh, that God wants every person to have fellowship with him, every person to be reconciled, every person to be part of his family. But the way that you do that, the way that you come to the Father is through his Son, Jesus. The Bible says everybody can be saved, but particularly only those who believe in Christ have a way back to God. Only those who believe in Christ can be acceptable to him. John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So some don't believe in God. Some don't believe in Jesus. It's for, important for us to understand. The Bible says to us, we need to believe in God. We need to believe in Jesus. And we need to not only say that we believe, but we need to also live like we believe. So that then leads us to this question. How should we believe? How should we believe? What does that look like? 
to answer that question, I want to give you the Enoch epitome. Now, what do I mean by that? Epitome is a big word. It means the perfect example, the perfect illustration. And to answer the question, how should we live? How should we believe? I want to look at the life of Enoch. There are not a lot of verses about Enoch, but I think he's a perfect illustration. I think he's a very achievable illustration of how we should aim, if we believe, to live like we believe. You look at Enoch, you see first that he walked with God. So I would say that to you. If you want to believe God, then walk with God. We meet Enoch in Genesis chapter 5, uh, beginning with verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became, and so there's the answer to the trivia question, who's the dad of the oldest man ever? Uh, Methuselah was the oldest man ever, 969 years, the Bible says in Genesis that he lived. Now, I would say to you, those people uh, sure must have been healthy eaters because they lived a long time. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Notice he walked faithfully with God. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. Two amazing things there. First, he walked faithfully. Now, you might say, of course he walked faithfully. He was one of the first men to live. Listen, from beginning, Adam and Eve sinned. From the beginning, it didn't take long for people to rebel against God. Enoch was the seventh from Adam. Seventh generation from the first man created. And all around him, the Bible says, people were wicked and ungodly and did their own thing. So we need to understand that just as today there are a lot of ungodly influences around us in this culture, there always have been. Sometimes people like to say, it is so bad today. People are, listen, it's always been bad. And all of us have a choice, like Enoch did, to even in the midst of all the temptation and ungodliness, to, you can walk faithfully with God. And so I take this both literally and figuratively when it says to walk faithfully. I think physically it's very possible that God walked around with Enoch like it tells us in the Garden of Eden that God walked around with Adam and Eve. But for us today, maybe it's not possible literally, but I will tell you, I take it literally in this way. For over the last two years or so, I have had the most extended period of faithful, disciplined walking walking on my feet with God. That's helped me to lose weight and get in much better shape. But even more, the reason I've been so consistent, the reason I, most every day I walk at least two miles, the reason that's happened is because it's become for me not a physical thing. It's become for me a spiritual thing. Every day when I walk, I don't wear headphones. I'm not listening to music. I'm spending time with God. As I walk, I'm asking God, now listen, I think I'm praying, I, you can pray with your eyes open. Please don't walk and pray with your eyes closed. But I can, I can spend time with God saying, God, how can I be a better dad? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better and live for you? How can I be more godly in being a dad and a godly father and a godly minister and a godly friend? How can, and it's amazing how that works. So I walk with God every day. But I think this is talking as well about uh, figuratively. Walking with is a synonym in the scripture for your lifestyle, living with godly values, living with making godly choices, saying godly things, having godly behaviors. And so when it says Enoch walked faithfully with God, it means he lived his life trying to talk and, and act and interact like God would want him to. Because of that, God took him away. Only two people you see in the Bible that didn't actually physically die. Elijah and Enoch. Enoch walked with God and he was no more. God, I think it kind of went like they were walking together one day and God said, Enoch, you want to come home with me? And then he did. Pretty cool. It's a testament to how faithful, how faithfully he walked. 
how faithfully he sought to live for God. Amos 3.3 kind of adds to this discussion. It says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? So what it means is that, that when you're walking with God, it means I think you're in rhythm with God. That's the meaning of the word, the Hebrew word there. It means to be in rhythm, to rhythmically move two together. <laughs> it calls to mind a tandem bicycle. You ever done a tandem bicycle? Hopefully you did it with somebody coordinated. Hopefully you did it with somebody that wasn't bullheaded. Because you have to get in rhythm with a tandem bicycle or it is a disaster waiting to happen, right? It's that, that kind of illustration brings to mind how we need to let God lead and get in rhythm with God in the way we live. We need to make being in rhythm with God a priority in our marriages, in our family lives, in our interaction with those that we work with, in our interaction with people at school, right? We're to be in rhythm. It's walking with God means to be in rhythm with God. Secondly, how do you live with God? How should we believe? And it shows us another way to well-please God, to well-please God. Now, when I actually wrote this, I put a hyphen in well-pleased. Do you know that well-pleased actually has its own definition in the Oxford English Dictionary? Uh, it's, it's literally an adjective. Well-pleased means to highly gratify or highly satisfy. So I shouldn't have had the hyphen there. Well-pleased is not an oxymoron. It said in the Gospels, Mark chapter 1, Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus, after he was baptized, came up out of the water, he heard a voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So it makes clear to me that we can well please God. And we see Enoch well please God by looking at the next mention of Enoch in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. But before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. There's belief. And rewards those who earnestly, there's lifestyle, seek him. Who earnestly seek him. Who try to live like he wants them to live. You see there that Enoch achieved that. Enoch sought to please God, and he did. I've been married almost 32 years. I've learned that there are some things that please my wife, and there's some things I do that don't. And most days, I try not to do the things that don't. Every once in a you just get ornery sometimes, don't you? Some days, I just don't care. Until I wake up, and then I care a lot, right? You, you know if you read Scripture, you know, you, you know there are some things you can do that please God. Enoch, I think, he prioritized in his life pleasing God. He not only said he believed, but he lived with values. He lived with actions, a lifestyle that pleased God. So I think we can. Now, I've got an assignment for you this week. I want you uh, devotionally to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, listen, walking with God is not something you do just every once in a while. If you only walk with God for an hour on Sunday morning, I'm saying to you it's going to be hard for you to, to live in a way that pleases God. It's going to be hard for you to live in, in a constant, consistent way. Walking with God. If he's only, you only meet him an hour a week, <clears throat> what, how do you do that? You read his word. You pray to him. As you read his word, you start to figure out there's some things you do. There's some choices you make. There's some words you say that please God and others that don't. Enoch prioritized pleasing God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, I want you to read in your devotional time this week because the subtitle of this section of this chapter is Living to Please God in the New International Version. Today's New International Version, the TNIV, is what we show on the screen. That's the subtitle, Living to Please God. And so from First Thessalonians 4, 1, you see this. And as for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. 
and as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So if you want to know how to please God, 1 Thessalonians 4 is a good place to start. Uh, verse 7, I, I want you to read the rest of the verses, but I want to read this verse to you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. How do you please God? You strive to live a holy life, a pure life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God. So if you want to believe and live like you believe, then you're going to strive to live a holy life, a pure life. Does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Please, living to please God is not that complicated. I think it becomes oftentimes more a matter of will, of volition, than knowledge. But it starts with determining we're going to please him. Enoch had that as his priority. So can we. He can be an example for us. Thirdly, I think Enoch shows us how we can believe in God by showing us we can be a witness for God. Maybe you didn't know this. Enoch was a preacher. There's a little book in the New Testament right before Revelation called Jude, the letter to Jude. And Jude only has one chapter. That's why it may look weird in your outline or on the screen when it says Jude 14 and 15, but it's only, there are only verses because there, there's no need to put a chapter. There's only one chapter. Jude 14 and 15 says, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, witness, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict them of all their ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Two things. One, Enoch, seven generations from the first man, already preached about ungodliness. He was a witness for God. And two, that people made godly or ungodly choices. Now let me say this, this culture was so ungodly that two generations later, the great flood came. After Noah had been, built an ark. So it should encourage us who have at our workplace folks who don't believe, who have in our family folks who don't believe, who have in our schools folks who don't believe. It should encourage us to be a witness. And let me say, oftentimes the best sermons, the best testimonies don't even use words as you Put into practice godly speech and godly actions. You can be a witness for God, and boy, God is pleased with that. Enoch was faithful to walk with God and to well-please God and to be a witness for God. So if you want to know how should you believe, I say the same. Last question I want to answer because I think it's important. What is the future for those who believe in God? What is the future for those who believe in God? We hinted at it when I read to you Hebrews eleven i I'll read it again. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch walked with God, and so what was his reward? He didn't have to experience physical death. God took him to be with him forever. Well, you might say, isn't that cool? I wish that could happen for me. And I'm going to say to you, it might just happen for you. When God gets tired of seeing all the rebellion and the evil of his people doing their own free will thing, he's going to come back, the scripture tells us. I ask you to study and meditate on 1 Thessalonians 4. Beginning in verse 13, you see this. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Let me say to you, I can't imagine conducting a funeral where people don't believe. What this is saying is, as you go to those times where people you love have experienced physical death, you don't grieve as those who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with 
Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will call up, caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I've read those words to people and they've gone, uh, what? No way. The eyes of faith believe. And I've seen God do so many things that I believe God no matter what. And what this tells me is that if I happen to experience physical death before he comes back, I'll go to be with him, and then I'll come back. But if I'm still living, if you're still living, that just like Enoch, one day you'll go to be with him. You will be no more on this earth, and you'll be reunited with those loved ones. So I imagine... When Jesus comes back, if I'm still here, beside him will be my grandmother. Maybe beside them will be Wallace Collett. Others of your loved ones who believed, who lived by faith and have believed, they will be with Jesus and they'll come back and and we'll go to be with them forever. Therefore, encourage one another. Let's Listen, the stakes are high here. I am telling you, it is so easy to live like those big earthly or heavenly things don't matter. But what we need to understand is we all will be held accountable. It is vital for you to be all in with your belief. It comes more easy to me. I'm one of those people that obsess on things. You know, for me, it's all or nothing. If I hear and get interested in something new, it is about that 24-7. Like now, I'm about HQ trivia, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask me. So you, you, you get, I'm telling you, it's easy to get distracted and not live for God, not live to please God, not walk with God every day. Don't make that mistake. Because if you choose to put God first, if you choose to prioritize walking with God, living for God, the reward you do not want to miss a place with him and others who believed for eternity. It's a why witness for God even when people don't like it, even when it makes them mad. Because I care more about them going to heaven than I do about them getting mad at me. Are you all in? Do you believe in God? Do you live like you believe in God? Fathers, we think about these things today. I pray that you've challenged us. I thank you for the reward. Maybe some of us right in this room will one day not experience physical death. We'll be taken up to meet you in the air. Others of us may die before that happens. But we have this sure promise that we can trust that we'll be with you. I pray, Father, that we would draw close to you. And as it says in the book of James, you'll draw close to us. Help us to not, help us to leave this place determined to put you first, to live for you. Not just say we believe, but to live like we believe. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's ministry time if you want to become a Christian. We'll help you with that. If you want to join us here at Northside, we'll help you with that. But it's a challenge for all of us, I think. How will we live this week? If we believe in God, how should we then live like we believe in God? Let's stand together and sing. If you have a decision, please come.
just what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life give me faith to trust my verses 17 through 20. And in here Jesus says, after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, this is, <clears throat> take this and divide among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom, the kingdom of God comes. They took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is now, is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. At this time, it's really easy for us just to kind of go through the motions and get into a rut and make this a more of a ritualistic th thing instead of a spiritual uh, renewal in our in our lives. And that's why I always always come back to when it said when Jesus tells us to do this in remembrance of of Him. Is you know this this celebrates the greatest gift we could ever give get, and it's when He came to, down from heaven and gave His life. There's an old saying that says, you know, nothing in life is free. And our spiritual life is the same way. I mean, Jesus paid for our sins. We didn't have to pay for it. Our freedom from sin was bought with a price. And that price was, was bought, was paid for by Jesus. So, <clears throat> so at this time, please, when you, when, you, when you meditate, please just remember that your freedom was paid, paid with a price. And it's paid for our, our, our loving God that, that paid it for us. So if you would, please pray with me. Dear Holy Father, Lord, we just come to you and just uh, we're grateful for the, the perfect gift, Lord, the gift of your son, Lord. And in John 3, 16, you say you loved us, loved us so much, Lord, that you sent your one and only son, Lord, to, to die for us, Lord, so that we would not perish but have everlasting life, Lord. Let us believe that, Lord. Let us focus on that, Lord. And as we walk out tomorrow and the rest of the week, Lord, let your light shine through us, Lord. Let us live that love that you've given us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So your bulletin has lots of announcements in it. I just want to highlight a, a couple of them. Uh, one, uh, we have the Super Bowl, which is something we do every February, uh, we, uh, or January and February. We collect cans of soup, and we donate all those to the food pantry. Uh, we are setting as a goal we, uh, 10,000 cans. We got close uh, last year. And we'd love to see that many cans from our folks uh, be donated to those that need them to eat at the food center. If you don't want to go shopping, uh, you can just make a donation and put on their Super Bowl. And we'll make sure the cans of soup, the cases of soup get bought with that. And I encourage you to be a part of that. That's our intentional act of kindness uh, for January as we're for the Burke. <clears throat> Two, I want to tell you about community groups. You might have noticed the table when you came in. Uh, we set these up. Uh, twice a year in semester form. And, and if you were part of a group in the fall and you still want to be a part of that group, then please, it helps us to organize everything to, for you to sign up for that group again. Uh, that would help us. If you haven't been in a community group, uh, I hope you will. 
if you'd like to think about leading or facilitating a group uh, and you have it before, then let us know and we can help you in that and uh, getting that going. Uh, with that said, I do a class called Real Life Discipleship every uh, two or three times a year. And uh, well, I'm starting one on February the 7th at 5.30 p.m. This is a class where we learn about being a disciple ourselves and learn how to make and influence other disciples, equip other disciples. And, and uh, it serves kind of as an introductory community group. Uh, so you, that might be up your alley. It's going to be Wednesdays, 5.30 to 6.30. And there will be child care provided for that. Uh, that'll start February 7th. So if you're interested in that, sign up for that. Uh, I say I lead that class, and it's a good time. We get to know each other better and get to know more what being a disciple is about. Lastly, I want to say, uh, highlight that we have weeks of joy baskets that we prepare for the folks that are uh, uh, trying to break the habit of addiction over at Pathways. And uh, I take these baskets every three or four weeks. I took four this week. And the, the ladies there get to open these while they're there, and it, it encourages them. It says to them, folks, care. And uh, we have, uh, every once in a while, our ladies come together to put these baskets together. The next one of those is this Saturday, uh, January 20th at 9 a.m. It's going to be in room 102. Normally they've met in the fellowship hall, but it's going to be room 102 in the ECC wing, or old ECC wing here. So if you're interested, ladies, in helping with that, please come uh, Saturday at 9. Good to have you with us today. Uh, I hope you have a great week. I hope you stay safe going home. And uh, let's stand together. I'm going to pray for us, and we'll be dismissed, okay? <clears throat> Father, I thank you for, uh, for the example of Enoch, who shows us what it is to, to live for you, to believe in you, and um, uh, it might seem undoable, unreachable for us, but a, a godly life begins with the first step and the first week, and I, I pray this week that you'll be first in our lives, that, that we'll meditate on and we'll, we'll prioritize, we'll seek to walk with you this week, and uh, we'll be faithful to it. I thank you, Father, for how you've been faithful to me even when I was far from you. And I know for each of us, each of us can be closer to you. And I uh, pray we, we, we do that. And thank you for your grace. Thank you for your patience with us. Help us to be strong. Help us to, to please you this week. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a great week.